morning. You know, if you give online, um, I'd encourage you during these times, we take a little bit of, you know, just with the piano or whatever. Uh, I'd encourage you just to really take inventory of what you just did, what you sowed, and put yourself in remembrance of what you're giving to the Lord. Um, Because it's important for you to remember uh, that the Lord has your heart. And, um, and, and I just believe we'll see really good things uh, from that. So um, before we pray, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to remind you of something that I was myself reminded of. <clears throat> I'm uh, one of those guys that takes notes on a lot of things. I'm Pastor Nate, if you don't know. Hey, we're glad to have you. I really, I am. Super, super amazing. Matter of fact, last night, we just, it's amazing to see the church and just to be able to be a part of such an incredible group that God has putting together and building. Um, Last night, we got to play with our kids. It was father, uh, not father, daughter. It was father, son night, and like for the kids, and we got to go hang out and play basketball and ping pong. I mean, it was just so fun. Dodgeball. It was tons of fun. My son was like, Dad, that was awesome. You know, we get in the car, and then he told Mama on the phone when we were on the way home, and I said, was it just just awesome? And he said, no, it was really awesome, because that's what he told me. And it really was. What was so cool was there was, I don't know how many people, felt like got lots, right? Like 75, probably all kids and adults. I don't know how many people was there, but it was amazing just seeing uh, fathers loving kids. And, you know, sometimes, uh, man, sometimes even as a guy, you know, you're not, you don't realize, you know, that you're doing well. But let me tell you, we have so many guys, you're doing well. It's just, it's special to see, and I'm just uh, so thankful uh, for that. But anyways, I was, I'm one of those guys that um, takes notes on things just whenever, sometimes I don't have my journal, or just like, if I do have a journal, it's one of the five that I'm in right now. How many of you are one of those people? Um, So there's good notes, and I have these, all these sermons in stacks from uh, I used to only use a use that paper instead of a computer. It took me really long, and I still am not that fast of a typer compared to most. You know, like 18 Guam, right? Um, anyway, which is not good <laughs> at all. But anyway, say all that to say, um, I keep these notes still because there's they, they still speak. They still speak, and one of them um, that I had written down, and I was kind of cleaning out my office a little bit, and I had this post-it note, and I had written down, uh, about fishing. I love to fish. And I've been working on getting this uh, Pasha Lake men's fishing trip, all the info out. And so it was on this fishing note uh, or on, about Pasha Lake. And, and um, sometimes in life, and this is kind of the gist of it, sometimes in life we're talking about, and I love to fish on the ocean. Like when I go down to Florida, I got to bring a fishing pole. I, if I tell Ev, which is my wife, if hey, I'm not going to fish this time. I'm just going to leave my fishing stuff at the house. We end up going to Walmart, spending $200 on fishing stuff so I can fish halfway through the week, okay? It just happens. So finally, I've, I've learned, the, learned my lesson. I'm going to fish. I'm going to fish whether it's hot. I'm going to fish whether it's cold. Uh, yesterday, I was out at the pond, and my son Caleb was with me, and he said, Dad, you know, it seems like they don't bite as good in the winter. I said, I know. I was just hoping to get lucky today. <laughs> and, and, and we didn't. Um, but just this note was said this, you know, sometimes the tide is high and sometimes the tide is low, but if we'll remember um, to just keep fishing, the tide won't, won't affect us as much. Sometimes in life, things, you're going to be going through some stuff that seems a little low. Sometimes you're going to be at a high tide, right? Like there's just things that are awesome, but if we'll just keep fishing, what will happen is, is we'll fulfill the purpose for which God created us. And, and the waves and the wind and, and all those things won't affect us like, like they would be intended to. Because sometimes it's the low that would want to take you out. But sometimes it is the high that causes you to no longer put your dependence upon the Lord. And um, anyway, so what is that? What is that? It just was reminded, man, keep fishing. Like, what's the point? I was actually uh, reminded of a conversation uh, of somebody. Um, and they said, what are we doing? You know? about church like you know what are we doing at beyond church like what are we doing like what are we doing and um we're fishing and if you're not I'd tell you to start because that's what Jesus said come follow me and I'll make you a fisher of man so let's let's get fishing what does that look like 
What does that look like? Uh, I, I was reminded of just, just you know, leadership things this week. <clears throat> I, I, I'm not supposed to tell you what that looks like. That'd be me, me putting you in a box. That'd be me giving you an assignment but instead of giving you the purpose, giving you what we're called to do, giving you the goal, and that would be to reach one. So what does that look like? I don't know. You tell me. And if you haven't put your mind on it for a while, I'd encourage you to put your mind on it because that's where you're going to find fulfillment because that's what God created you for. What does it look like to reach one? I can't tell you that. That's what God set you in a place, and he said, I've given you this. Now steward that gift and steward that well, and I'm going to do the same thing. Lord, what does it look like to reach this one? And, and that's the goal. What does it look like if I was going to reach one this year? What does it look like? What would this church look like if you and I were just to reach one, this just one, just you and your family, like you were to reach one and, and extend as far as necessary? That's what I would say it looks like, what that looks like for you. I don't know. Maybe it's opening your mouth. Maybe it's starting a relationship. Maybe it's calling somebody back. I don't know. That's up to you. But I'll tell you what. Well, um, you, you, we need to remember um, why we're here. And why we come here is so we can go out there. We've got to remember these shirts that have arrows on it. Will you stand up, Chelsea, and turn around? We've got this arrow on these shirts that's hanging around. It's on the signs. Thank you. It, it, the thing about the, this arrow is it's not just a brand. It's for us to remember that there's something in here. There's something in here that has to get out there. That's what we're called to do. Guys, that's, that's where life's found. That's where, that's where the, I'll find myself walking with God. And I'll find God show up in that situation. When I see him show up with those people and in these prayers, I'll realize when I'm, when I'm praying for myself that I'm going to see and my confidence won't be shaken because I know he's the same and he's not a respecter of persons. I'm telling you guys, your faith will never grow, will never be strengthened unless it's activated. No more than weights upstairs will cre create any change in this body unless I put my hand to him. Guys, the victory that you're looking for, it's found in our faith. First John says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. But listen, if faith isn't working, it's dead. There's got to be some corresponding actions to what you believe. And that what you believed, if you're saved, you believed on some good news. And that is this, that Jesus was enough, that Jesus paid a price. That Jesus paid a price and he paid a complete price. Hey, ushers, will you pass that, that, that out this morning? We're in a series, uh, list, uh, um, they're going to be passing out uh, some communion cups, and we're not going to take them right now, um, it'll be towards the end of service. <clears throat> um, yeah, so as they're doing that, let's just pray before we get into the Word. Father, thank you so much uh, for just joining us here together. Thank you that you've uh, drew our hearts here to be here, and we just honor you this morning. We give you that high seat, and we just ask you to speak to, speak to us. We open our hearts to what you would have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in the series uh, just a, a couple of weeks. I, you know, last week I talked about uh, sounding the alarm. And this wasn't a planned uh, uh, series. As a matter of fact, I had something else that I had already planned. And I was I picking up on something in my heart. And it just seemed to be confirmed and confirmed and confirmed again about uh, how, the, the, how the time is short, right? And Satan, when the time is short, he knows he's going to pull out every stop. He's going he's gonna to try to get all, he's going to do the full scale attack. And so there's this picture, I don't know, do you have the picture of that plane still? Uh, the, the, of the series graphic? I don't know, you can pull it up eventually. Um, but this is... Uh, that, that, kind of, that kind of deal, the understanding that Satan is warring, and as the time gets short, he wants to pull out, use every weapon that he has, right, in your life and, and in my life. And so we're talking about just this offense, right, offense. And I'm telling you what, uh, that's what really last week was. It wasn't so much preaching to get you to make a decision, but simply to sound the alarm. And uh, I was, I was talking with Landon and Jake uh, this week, and they were kind of gave me that smirk because my, my alarm, you know, he said, you put your hand over the mic where it made it really loud, and I was like, I know, and I did it really long, and then you were smiling on the front row, and because you started smiling, I just kept on <laughs> because it was like, okay, we get the point, and I was like, yeah, you're going to really get the point, <laughs> and I mean, just sometimes, you know, you know, you just kind of, it's kind of like your wife telling you to take out the trash, right? You get, you, well, you were going to do it, but I'll do it when I'm re ready to, you know, right? All right. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, so I was sounding the alarm that Satan would love, would love to be active in your life in every way. 
every way possible. And uh, we, we had this scripture, uh, James chapter 3, 13 through 18. It says, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying um, and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, but the wisdom that's... Because the things that are going on inside is the wisdom that descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Somebody say devilish. So there's a wisdom that can come to you. And we, this is what we're saying. There's a thought that makes sense. There's a, there's a, there is, a, uh, in a sense, a bait that's presented to you that looks good. All the things about it. But this, this, this offering to you or this reasoning that's very reasonable, very makes sense. Um, he says this. It's devilish. And he says, where there's envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. We talked about confusion being instability. That would be the basis, but I wanted to hit on every. Every means this. Every means individually. Like, can you make sure you pick up every piece of trash? Like every single one. How many of you ever said every single one? So every we know is, is singular, but every is also collectively. Can you pick up every one of those? Every means all. So Satan would love to, to, to get every single one of his plans in your life to, bring, to seal, kill, and destroy. Every one. But he'd also like to get every one. Like all of them. So he's just handing out assignments, right, to, the, uh, uh, the, to all of his little cohorts. And he's handing out, hey, you do this, hey, you do this, hey, you do this, hey, you battalion of this, hey, you infantry that, hey, you this, hey, you this. Here's your assignment, hand them out. And, and he would love to, to have access into your life. Did you know that, that you, can, uh, you have authority over Satan, but you also can relinquish your authority and you can say, come on, work. You can give Satan power in your life and the most powerful Satan ever will be and ever can be is when he partners with a man. Right. Period. Right. This is why you see even like what we, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Antichrist. He can't just, Satan can't just come up and set up shop. He has to use a man. That's just the way it is because authority was given back. He has to use a man. And so let me tell you, there's a lot of times he's using this man. That man. That man. That woman. That woman, listen, he, he, he gets us to partner with him by us looking at natural things. And so I was talking about that. Listen, sound the alarm. The enemy was to try to get you and I offended with one another. And he would try to get us offended with the very people that God designed us to be together with. And so we, we were sounding that alarm uh, of, and asking this question, what wisdom are you operating from? Because he says there's this wisdom that's devilish, but then it goes on to say right after that, verse 16, uh, right after verse 16, he says, but there's a wisdom that's from above. There's a wisdom that's pure. There's a wisdom uh, uh, that, that, that is gentle. It's easy to be entreated. Have you ever, in other words, to be, to be, to be brought in, full of mercy and good fruits. And so we just asked that question, what, what are you listening to? What am I listening to? And so we were, just, we were talking about those things. And, and I want to kind of pick up from right there. You know, every one of us have, has a wounded heart story. Every person here has a wounded heart story. Um, and, you know, a lot of us uh, don't deal with it, right? A lot, and I would say every one of us in here has dealt with it wrong at time or, or two, okay? Uh, and I want to read a story real quick out of, out of Genesis chapter 11. And because the Bible tells us that um, Satan, you know, he has an MOA, Mode of operation. His mode of operation uh, and what he shoots for, he shoots for the heart. How many of you ever, if you've ever been hunting, I know maybe this offends some people, I'm sorry. But if you're going to go hunting, you want to shoot to kill. You want to shoot, where do you shoot? Right behind the shoulder, you tell the kids. You know, right behind the shoulder, right? Just follow that leg up, shoot right there. That's where the heart is. And you shoot for the heart because if you could take out the heart, you can take them out. If you can take out the heart. And, and so that's what the enemy, that's how he works. He goes after the heart. He gets us to, 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 to receive something as truth in our heart. Or he gets us to hurt, our heart to hurt real bad. I want you to see this in Genesis. Um, because, you know, you don't go very far with a heart shot. You're going to recover that deer. 
This is Genesis chapter 11. And how many of you ever heard of Abram or Abraham? This is a story of his father. Oh, your father. All right. I don't know. Genesis eleven twenty seven. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Ab- Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. Okay? And Haran died. This is really key. So Terah had three sons. And, and of these three sons, one of them dies. Listen, this is really interesting. This is verse 28. Haran died be, before his father in the land of his nativity in Ur of, Chaldea, of Chaldees. Okay? And so his son dies, right? And Abram and Nahor uh, took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, which was going to be changed to Sarah later on, which means breath. The H in there actually means breath. So Abraham, the father of our faith, gets an H added, which it means that's how you would say spirit. The H. Say H. H. Like, make the sound. Yeah, right? That's what it is. That's how they talk about. That's, how the, that's what is represented there is that Abraham, that's what's, if you look in the Greek, or not the Greek, Hebrew. Anyway, very interesting. So Sarah becomes, or Sarah becomes Sarah. Sarah. Both of them get the H added. And the name of uh, uh, Nahor's wife, uh, what, how do you say that? Milka? Yeah, Milka, the daughter of, of Haran. The father of Milcah and the father of Issachar. But Sarai was barren and she had no child. And, and Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran's wife, uh, or the son of Haran's, Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. They went forth with them from Ur of Chaldees to go into a land of Canaan. So let me just say it this way without reading all these words. Because sometimes these words make, you try, I, I, I'm trying to communicate something that I, my words aren't doing, or these words, the way I'm reading them, because I'm trying to hurry, and they're backwards, okay? <laughs> Terah had three kids. He was, at, he was living in a land, and one of his sons dies. So he runs from that land because his heart hurts. Everywhere he looked, he was reminded of pain. So he picks up his family, all of his family, his family, which would include both of his sons and their wives and their daughters, and says, boys, these are the, this, this is what I have. This is what I love. Let's go into this place called Canaan. Canaan, all through the Bible, is representative of the promised land. It's the place that God told Abraham, I want to take you. But yet it's really interesting. The place that God took Abram, was the place that God wanted to take Terah, who was hurt. And so on the way, listen to this, they're on their way to the land of Canaan, and they came to a land called Haran. Did you know this land that they walked into on their way to Canaan that had the name Haran was the same name of his son that died? And it says this, they dwelt there. They dwelt, in Her- they dwelt in Haran when they were headed to Canaan. And I've, this is huge. And it says, And the days of Terah were 205 years, and, Her- and Terah died in Haran. Not in the promise. Terah didn't die in the promise. Terah didn't die in Canaan where God was taking him. He died in Haran, a land that reminded him continually of his son. His heart was broken. He lay down. He died there for 200 years. I don't know how old he was when he got to Haran, but he was there long enough that it said he was there this long, and he died there. And then God said, hey, I'm not done. And he got a hold of Abram, and he said, pick up. Leave this place. You were never meant to stay in this place of hurt. And, I, and let's take you from this place of hurt. Let me go you, take you to a land that I will show you. And so we're talking about this morning, we're talking about offense and how it can keep you and I from the very promise for which God designed you and I to operate. These very graces, the plan and, and purposes of God in your life. The Bible says that they're without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. 
Okay, and, and these gifts, the Bible says before you were ever born, that, that he, 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 and you were formed in your mother's womb, he appointed you, he prepared, the Bible says, good things for you and I to walk in, because he's good. The Bible says in Ephesians that for ages to come, we're going to be talking about his goodness. But, Satan has an MOA, or a mode of operation, when, when we first see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness of Satan, it says that he stood up. How many of you ever stood up to Satan? You stood up to, and you answered back, and you talked back, right? And then it says this about Satan. He left for a more opportune time. This is his mode of operation. He leaves for a more opportune time. In other words, when he wants to take a heart shot, he waits till everything is lined up. Have you ever had that happen when, 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 these, when these, the destruction of relationships happen? When, 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 the, when something happens in a relationship to where you just, it's just never the same? And then there's a the statement that it can never be the same, which is a bunch of trash. Yeah. Well, that's been broken. It just can never be the same. I thought God was the one that could restore that which was broken. That's what he said. He said he could take what with a canker or what the, what the worm, the, the ate in the corn. Think about pe- peeling corn in the summer. And you open it and there's a worm and the cor- kernels are gone. He can restore that back. He can put every kernel back on the cob. That which has been eaten and just looks like a load. He can put every piece back exactly. This is the God that we serve. And sometimes we, 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 we're, we're, we have this teenage mentality in our church, and I love Malachi, I'm going to be talking about this, about how God says this, yet you say, yet you say, yet you say. You know there's a lot of yet you says that we say back to God and we talk back? How many of you know you're talking back to God doesn't produce favor with him? No more than your teenager running their mouth back at you when all you gave was a simple direction. My direction was not, was not, was not optionable. It was a direction. Now, I'm giving you the choice, right, to, to whether what you're going to walk in. But let me tell you, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not in agreement if you decide not to walk in what I directed you to do. And therefore, you're going to set yourself in opposition to God. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, I'm not kidding you. The Bible says that, that the, he opposes the proud. Like you set yourself in opposition. Yeah, well, this is what I say. What I say, that's pride. So he goes, uh, we're, we're, we're looking here. Uh, um, what were we talking about? Abraham. Yeah. Somebody else, help me out. Yeah, more opportune time. All right, back, just pop back in. Thank you. So he left, he leaves for a more opportune time until everything's lined up. Did Satan actually, in a sense, waits for God to do his work. Get everything in place. And this is why when these things uh, why they really hurt so bad because we talk about offenses that really hurt so bad. You don't get offended with the world because your expectation of them so low. But as you come to know somebody, your love and your expectation and you know who they are increases and therefore the offense is a whole lot greater. And so God's working. Have you ever been through the season in your life where it seems like, man, you're just making huge progress? God connections, God, that, like man, just things, things. And then all of a sudden when everything's lined up, this is the opportune time. This is the opportune time when, and this is why it's an oppor- this is this is why it's so dangerous, or so so wonderful. Satan knows that God God's going to bring about His plan on the earth, and it's going to be through people. Okay, and so the way He does it is He He sets in 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 place the right combinations. The combinations of what you and I need are actually found within one another. He didn't, he, never, he didn't set us up to where we could just do it all alone. 
But he, he put these things on the inside of each and every one of us. And so Satan can sense when certain combinations like the H and the 2 and the O are coming together to create something that's never existed before or an element that would, be, would be, uh, create great impact for the kingdom of God. And so you see these people that are aligned and you see this, this guy and this family and this family coming together come in, and you see the gifts and the graces and, and there's a passion in their heart or, or things that are going on, and, and just when they get together, Satan wants to try to create something so he can create a division and take and scar every one of those hearts, and then, therefore, no longer the combination that God put together, no longer will we be able to access what was in another and another and another because we're hurt, we're scarred, and our estimation of them has now changed. And if my estimation of somebody doesn't match what God says about them, I'm deceived. But if, if he gets my heart, if my heart is hurt, what my heart holds, my mind will remember. Heron, heart hurt. Heron. What my heart holds, my mind will remember. My voice will recall. And so what I'll recall about them is not what God said about them, but I'll recall how they hurt me. And what in essence will happen is, is the very combination that God set up to unlock a grace that He prepared or a gift that He prepared before you were ever born, you will not have access to. If, if this picture of the planes, I don't know, do we have that? Maybe it was up at one time. We don't. It got deleted. It's gonzo. All right. But there was a picture of these, these planes that were dropping bombs, okay? This is the whole invasion series, two weeks, okay? These planes, the first thing you're going to do if you're going to wage war against somebody, you are going to take out what? Where, where, where are you? Communications? But what, what are you going to take out? What are we going to go take out? Probably their weapons? Maybe that would be the place to hit them. Eliminate their weapons. They can't fight. Did you know the combinations that God has placed against this, to storm the gates of hell and to bring the kingdom is combinations of people? It's combinations of, of this one and that one and this one. But if there's static, if there's hurt, if there are these kind of things, what happens is our estimation doesn't match God's. And what happens is, is the Bible says, where there's strife and discord. Strife simply means this, to place, it's like this picture of king on the mountain. Who's going to be on top of who? I'm right. No, you're right. No, I'm, or I'm right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. They did, there's this placing of over the top of one another. Instead of doing what God said, and that is what? Surrendering. Sitting down, coming underneath. And, and, and I didn't say change the value of you. I said say what God says about you and what God says about them. What you'll find is you'll find yourself placing yourself under. And I did this analogy of this poor, right? There can be things in the pitcher, in the, in the Kool-Aid jug. Listen, but as much as you want the Kool-Aid, as much as you want this soda pop, unless, unless you're willing to position that cup, that vessel, this vessel full. Everyone in here, the Bible tells us that we're vessels. We're containers. We, there are things that you and I carry that are graces and gifts of God that he gave to you. Listen, but unless, unless I position myself and honor what God honors, I'll never access the things that are in them and therefore walk in the fulfillment that God desires for my life. Satan knows how to get you and keep you from, be, from, from in a sense, that, that combination, that turn the lock. How many of you know, if you've ever done one of those master locks where you turn it this way and this way and this way, if you're off by just one number, if your estimation doesn't match what's on the box, you're not getting in to that lock. As hard as you want it, as much as you want it, as much as God loves you and has given it to you, God, and we blame God for not getting in, into some of the things that we, that, 
that we want in our life. But the fact of the matter is, they're all around us. And there are combinations, there are things that God has given somebody that He's not going to give to you. He gave it to you in them. And unless you unlock it, unless you, uh, unless you uh, choose, choose to realize the enemy at work and let God do some repair and etch in your heart and in your mind that combination again, you will not access it. So this morning, <clears throat> I, I, I want to, uh, the title of this morning's message is this, Contemplate, Contemplate. How many of you ever contemplated? I just don't know why, I just don't know, I can't see why, I can't see how they, how many of you ever done, went over, over again and again? How many of you have been feeding on an offense? How many of you ever have been feed, have ever fed on an offense? Let me show you what it looks like. I, I, I just don't know why they would have said that. I, I can't believe that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have been here. Don't they know? I can't, I can't believe. If they loved me, they would have. It's, it's, they, they would have done this or they wouldn't have done this. How many of you know you can't win when someone says, well, if you would have or you wouldn't have. Well, what do you want me to do? It has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with you and your heart. So contemplate. What have I been contemplating? What have I been feeding on? And, and so really this whole message this morning was talking about, okay, so I'm offended. Yeah, I'm ticked off at that person because of what they did. Yeah, that relationship and blah, blah. blah. There are people that you have written off. There are combinations that God started and, 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 and just whatever. But let me tell you, this is how it starts. It starts like this. Offense starts. And from offense, you go to betrayal. Betrayal, sometimes we don't know what that means. It simply means I'm going to do whatever it takes to preserve me over the relationship. Preserve me over the nation. Preserve me. This is what happens. Offense leads to betrayal to where now I'm only, my eyes are only on myself. And from that place of that, I go to hate. And hate simply means love less. I'll move to the place where there's just no love, no feeling for them at, at all. Or there is like immense hate, but sometimes it's just emotionless. Did you know that there is an emotion that comes with love? There's a, there's a, there's a, how you do it, right? There's a, there's a, there is something where your heart actually says you want to embrace them. There's, and, and so there, the, hate just simply means love less. Like, there, there, there's a, a story in, in the Bible of one of David's sons that, and how they didn't like each other, but no one ever knew it because he didn't show disdain for him. He just didn't show love for him. He just, whatever. How many, how many of you could recall somebody that's in the same room as you or you, when you come in contact with them, there once was this, hey, buddy, hey, bud. High five, and now you just see him in passing. and you hope you don't have to get in a conversation with him. If there's ought in your heart, it, there's still a wrong thought. Ought is proof of wrong thought. And there's combinations that God's created that you and I uh, need to access. If we're gonna, and Satan knows that, and this is why he tries to take a heart shot. He waits for an opportune time when things are aligned, when you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right things with the right people, and then all of a sudden, boom. That's when the opportunity is right. When there's a bunch in the area, you take a shot, you can't miss. You'll take out something. And you'll probably damage a lot on the way. And those birds might make it off. Have you ever seen one of those big blackbird flocks coming through? When I was a kid, I, you know, like migrating. I, when I was a kid, I used to always think, I wish I had a shotgun. I was like Caleb. And I used to think, I wish, I wish, I just wonder, I just wonder like what would really happen. Some would probably drop, but some would be wounded, but you wouldn't know it. And they'd fly off, and some would pass, pass out and die a few hundred yards down the road that you would never know about. This is what happens when, when offense comes. There's people that are offended, that, that got the, this, this shot was between three tight families, 
but the friend of that family no longer associates with the other one. And, and it was God creating something bigger that your eyes hadn't seen, your ears haven't heard, neither, but yet God was doing a work. And Satan tried to take it out. So, I, I, I know if you aren't offended right now, you will deal with offense soon. The Bible says it's impossible that offenses won't come. So let me tell you, it's coming. So what is the key to, to walking in uh, offense-free? And what would be the key to getting offense out of my heart to where now I, I, can, I can access that which God designed for me? What would be the key? That I'd say first and foremost would be this, and then we'll get to, in a sense, the message this morning. Would be number one, forgive. Beforehand, give somebody else the right to mess up. Give them, so just, just be, a, if you forgive, that's what, if you forgive, you, you'll eliminate a lot of problems. I want you to see this uh, in Psalms. Let's see if I can find it here. My notes, it's a ways down. Um, it just talk, it talks about how the strong person in the, in the word is not easily offended. Somebody that is strong in the word. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. You want to not be offended? Love God's word. It, what happens is if you begin to love, love God's word, if you, what happens is, is you become like your father. So you begin to take on his characteristics. The same way if you hang out with somebody a lot, you'll begin to take on their characteristics. I could, I, it's been a little while since I've been over in Oklahoma. I have a, a friend uh, that I hunt with over there by the name of Travis, and he'll, uh, he, he, he has certain things that he says, and I find myself coming home saying the kind of same voice inflections at times, and I'm like, my gosh, I'm sounding like Travis. And it's, why is that? Because I was hanging out with him for a week. Listen, you hang out with him for a week, you start hanging, you love his word, what will happen is, is you'll begin to take on his characteristics. You know what his number one characteristic is? Love. You know what love doesn't do? Count. It doesn't count a suffered wrong. It, 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 it's e, it's, it forgives, it's patient, it's gentle, it's kind, all these things. You'll begin to take on the very nature of your father and you won't even have to try to forgive, you just won't be offended. How many of you just don't want to be offended? I just don't want to battle that junk. I don't want to constantly run into that over and over and over and over and over again. And it, I'm telling you, it, it distracts and it causes a delay upon the journey where he's called you to. He's called you to Canaan. He's called you to a, a promised land flowing with milk and honey. He's called you there, but offenses will show, slow you down. And you may not die in Heron, but you may die along the way because, well, you just couldn't get that out of your boot. You could, just couldn't get that out of your heart. So what it, the key would be, number one would be, man, become like your father. How does that happen? Just fall in love with his word. Yeah, well, I just, everyone's always telling me, you've got to read the word. It just feels like this is doing, doing, doing. He's just simply telling you, hey, you want to walk in a life that's filled with what I prepared for you, or do you want to have to constantly battle and, and, and fight and fight and fight? No, hang on to this. Love this. Psalms 119, 165. Love this. All right. But I want to get to my, an object lesson this morning, and, and this is why I called it contemplate. C-O-N, con. How many of you know a con artist would be a deceptive person? How many of you know you and I, when we, when we contemplate, you know Eve was deceived by her understanding? Let's just put the, throw that out there. Eve was deceived. Adam and Eve were deceived by their understanding. Let me tell you, you will be too. You will be too. I will be too, by my understanding. So as I contemplate what happens, what ends up happening is I, I, I begin to walk myself into a, a story. In other words, the accuser, the, 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 the accusing attor uh, uh, attorney, the one that's there presenting the case against me or against them, it'll be, yeah, 
And I'll, and I'll see all the evidence build in such a way that I, I will hold them and I'll stand as judge and I'll call them guilty and I'll make the call, okay? This is what happens when we contemplate. We are deceived, okay? So contemplate. And on my, on my notes, it didn't translate this way uh, through uh, Google Drive or whatever to, to up there. But I said capital C-O-T-N or C-O-N, con. And then I did a lowercase t, but I upped the, I upped the font to 26, So a lowercase t simply looks like a cross. And then I left the rest capitalized. I plate. Contemplate. And I just saw this picture as I was doing it. So I was like, okay, because I was asking the Lord, how how do do I walk in forgiveness? How do do you and I walk in forgiveness? And and the Lord just simply said this to me. He said, sit down, plate it, and eat it. Contemplate. It just made sense. He said, sit down at the table, plate it, and then eat it. So, sit down with your father at the table, plate it, and then eat it. And I want to talk through each one of those things. That would be sit down, plate it, eat it. If you want to be free from offense, if you want to... Uh, if you want to, to walk in, in a way that, that God designed for you, if you want to see the combinations that God, before you were ever born, and he, set, he didn't just set you here, he set them here. And that's why Satan's fighting against it. This is why it, it's such a, it's a constant a ringing in your heart or a ringing in your ear. So what do you do? You sit down, you plate it, and then you eat it. And so I have this object lesson, and then I'd ask, um, uh, let's see here. Ben Brajan, why don't you come up here? Sit down. It's the Father. This is the, 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 and I'm going to act like Jesus today, all right? Having this conversation. So the key, first step for you and me to ever, um, to ever be free from offense, what you and I have to do is we have to sit down, Okay? And this is a plate. You can hold on to this. Actually, you can put the plate up there. I want to just talk about sitting down. I want to talk about sitting down with the Father. I want to talk about what happens when you and I sit down. And I want you to see that this is the Father's table. A place of fellowship, a place of conversation. Okay? So sit down, because you'll never be healed unless you talk to the Father. You can't just bury it, but you sit down. And you know, it's interesting. He sets a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I wonder what he serves at that table. Interesting thought. So let's talk about this. uh, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. So when I say take a seat, I mean get lower. A a little lower. A, a, A little lower. Get lower. In order to sit, in order to take a seat, you have to get lower. You have to not stand in the presence of your Father. You sit down in His presence. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if there's any comfort in His love, if any common uh, sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, love others above yourself. Above yourself. And not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have this mindset. The same mindset as Christ Jesus. And he goes on to describe this mindset. Who he didn't think of, he was God. But he came down and said, I'm going to come as a form of a man to serve you. So sit down, and just as you sit down, just be reminded of Christ's How he came and he took a seat and he came as a man to serve you and me. Let this mindset be in you. Let it be in me. And it says in verse uh, 8, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Therefore God, listen what happened here. This is why I want you to sit down because I want you to see and I want you to have the same mindset of Jesus. When he sat down, 
God did something to him. When, God, when Jesus sat down, when he came as a man, and he came and sat down his, he sat down his godly, he, as God, and he came as a man, it says that God did something for him. It says this, that God exalted him. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name. This is what God, you, this is right here, this position, sitting down to hear what the Father has to say is, is, is you, your key to having God move on your behalf, partnering with him to set you in a place that you couldn't put yourself. He gave him the name above every name. God gave Jesus this name. Why? Because of what he did. Because he sat down. So let's have this, uh, this, this mindset that if I'm going to get out of a, this place of offense, I just need to come and sit with the Father. Just come and sit with him. But then once I come and sit, we're not coming just to sit. I'm coming and it, it kinda, it's kind of a, a two-fold deal. I got a plate. I got to plate it. Okay? And this is, I got a fence. Every which way you look at it, it's a fence. So will you plate that, please? Let's talk about, no, oh, I, I, however you would eat it. <laughs> Walking in forgiveness takes me presenting my case to the Father. Here's what I love. All through the Bible, you see Satan as the accuser. He's presenting a case, he's, or he's twisting. And, you know, he, that's his very name. When every time he says his name, he's a twister, okay? And you know, we can be deceived, but you know who's not? The judge. Judge isn't deceived. That's why he sits up there, because he's wise. He's all-knowing. So he sits on that place, and, and you're sitting with the judge here. It's just a pretty, pretty powerful thought that you and I get to sit down with, um, with the judge. So you're going to plate your offense. Man, it does. It sound, and he, here's would be the father's response. Man, it does sound like they did you wrong. Man, wow, that is, that is intense. The story that you're presenting to the judge. Now, the judge, <clears throat> he tells you Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, um, Sounds like they, they did you real wrong. Um, but I, I don't want you to avenge yourself. Uh, beloved, l- leave room for God. Let me, let, me, let me avenge, be your avenger. And let me, let me uh, avenge for you, for vengeance is mine, says God. Yeah, get them, God. How many of you ever just thought that? I wish God, I could, just get them, God. It's like, hey, buddy, I see how they did you wrong, and I'm just, okay? I know. I see it. I see that. I just want to remind you, don't take it into your own hands, because vengeance is mine. I'll take care of them. How about you just pray that prayer? Pray the prayer. God, deal with them. Take out your vengeance upon them and your wrath on them the same way you did to me. Do it the same way you did to me. Make that your prayer because you can't have what you didn't ask for. Make it your prayer that I would do the same thing that I would take. Matter of fact, you, this, this, this conversation we've been having, you've been telling me how this offense is, uh, is all their fault. Why don't you cut that, that, that sandwich to show me how much of it was their fault. Is it half of it their fault? Because that kind of seemed like there was a lot more the way you were talking. Pretty much most of it. <laughs> All of a sudden, he remembered that the measure that I measure with, I'm going to be measured by. All of a sudden, sitting in the presence of a just judge, this is Matthew, the measure, be wise in the measure that you measure with. Because the measure that you measure with, you will be measured by. And if we would sit down with our Father, if we'd sit down and we begin to plate our offense, what would happen is we would realize that I'm judging people by a standard that I don't judge myself by. 
And all of a sudden, what will begin to happen is, is God sitting there, he'll begin to talk back to you. And the same thing it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and I love this because it says we cast down strongholds, right? Put it up. I, I didn't give you the, I don't even think I gave you this verse, but it tells us that we, we demolish strongholds. We take every strong, these things captive and bring them to the obedience of Christ. By what? By continuing to preach the word, and this is even this morning, my prayer was this. By, pray, by teaching the word, what's happening is, by your permission or not, because you sat down in that chair, the word of God was presented. And the same way he sat at a table, he heard what the father said and when he was presenting his case and saying, God, deal with them. They heard, he heard what God was saying when you, I said, cut the sandwich. Because that's how I'm going to deal with you. But you're sitting there and you get to hear the word of God that has the ability to cast down strongholds. It, it, Paul didn't say, you do it. He said, I'm doing it. I wish I could show you here where he said, and take some time here. But where Paul, what he was declaring was that we take, we, we're, we're doing it for you. When we bring the word of God, we're doing it for you. When I speak the word of God, yeah, we should do it for ourselves and bring him to the obedience of Christ. But by simply telling you the truth, I'm able to, to, to cast down some strongholds. I'm able to come to your aid. God is, by the word of God, is being presented and able to free you from these strongholds, which is simply the place that's in your mind where you've agreed with something that is contrary to what God has said. But you hear what God has said, and in your heart you go, yeah. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like, you know, you were a bit like this in your mind, and because you heard what God said again. Because you sat with the Father, you cut your sandwich, and have you ever had anybody talk, and they're talking, and they got their knife in their hand while they're talking, you know, and you're like, put that down, and they might even just do this, you know, that was landing, all right, let me show you a couple of a couple of things as you played it, because I, I want you to play this with, I want us to go through this exercise with the Lord today. I want us to sit down with the Lord, and I want us to play um, our offense, present it before him, uh, and, and I want you to remember um, the Lord's your defender. I want you to be mindful of the, me the measure that you measure with. Um, and then I want to remind you of Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus said this. He said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a man or a king who went to settle accounts with his servants. And you've maybe heard this story, but I'm going to let you hear it again. And as he began to settle the man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, it was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered him and his wife and his children and, and to be sold to pay the debt. And at that, the servant fell at his feet and said, Lord, be patient with me, he begged. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. Sometimes we're waiting for somebody else to pay back. Here's the Lord's response. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt. Canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But he refused and instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their masters everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. He's talking to servants. This is not talking to the world. He's talking to servants. So I'm talking to the church this morning. He said, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of, you, of yours because you asked me. God, forgive me. He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants that I had? Verse 34, in anger, his master handed him over to the jail sayers, now, uh, the, the jailers rather, to be tortured until he could pay back what he owed. I want to define that, that jailers. The word there, the jailers, is simply the torturers that would stretch a man until truth came out. 
In a sense, the same thing that you see Paul saying, uh, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that in the end his soul would be saved. In other words, I can't stand with you if you're going to sit here and you're going to present a case and you're going to judge uh, by somebody by a standard that you weren't judged. What's going to happen is you're going to set yourself in opposition to me. And I'm going to have to take a step back away from making a way for you until, until what happens is you spew forth the truth. Or the truth is never found in you. Did you know you can die in a place that, that, that where God created you? You can still go to heaven, but never walk in, into what he created you for because you were never, as much as stuff that you go through, you blame it on God, you blame it on them. Listen, it's, a, it's your choice. And the master said, I'm turning you over to a, a place. It's the same thing you see where, where God opposes the proud. You see the same thing with Paul. This is not a one time. This is, this is scripture. Sometimes we don't want to hear hard things because the fact of the matter is if you come to church and you don't leave having to make a choice, you probably didn't hear the word. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. God says, choose life. How do you want me to deal with you? And he, said, and he puts it out and he goes on to say this, tortured until you should pay him back. This is how I deal, how the heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the... From the, see, forgiveness is of the heart. It doesn't make sense in the head. And as long as we stay in the head, as long as we stay, stay up and present our case, and we st- we're, the, we're the prosecutor, instead of taking the seat and letting God begin to question us, we present our case, and then the judge begins to question us, we'll never access because why? When he, when he begins to speak, he speaks to our heart. You're hearing this morning when the word is coming out and he's talking about how he judged you. I didn't talk to your head. All of a sudden I hit you in the heart. Why? Because the word of God hits us in the heart. And that's the only place I can be healed. Because of what my heart holds, my mind will recall and my mouth will voice. And he wants to heal our heart. So what he does is he, while this is going on, he plates it and, and he takes... I love this. And in this conversation, this is what's going on. And he's listening. Because I love how the Father sets a table for you and and he serves you. But yet, it's a table for two. The way that he does it, it's a table for two. And as he's talking to you and he's telling you about how much he loves you and and he's telling you uh, uh, of all that he's done for you. And and he's he's showing you that, hey, listen, I believe in you. He's he's taking uh, his lunch out and he's setting it down and he breaks it and he lets it down right there. And he, as he sits that down there, he says, well, it's going to be a little dry if we don't have something else. And he pours it down and, and he lays it out right here just like this. And he says, hey, bud, take, take, eat. Go ahead. What do you want? Go ahead and take. You, you have whichever one you want. I'll, t- I'll take the other. Have which, whatever one you want, you can have. I'll take the other. Because I want you to see what, what, this is Paul talking. And he says this, and I got, <clears throat> for I receive, what I'm giving you, you right now, and I'm reading this right out of scripture. Um, for I received from the Lord what I'm passing on to you today. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. I received from the Lord what I'm passing on to all of you today. The Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, he took bread and he he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said that this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Listen to Isaiah 53 when we talk about the body. This is what we need to remember when the bread is laid before us, when his body is laid before us. 53 verse 5. But because of our sins, because of what you and I have done wrong, I, I was wounded. I was beaten because of the evil that, that you did. And, and we're healed by the punishments 
that I, you can be healed by the punishments that I suffered. There is punishments that you've been suffering from offenses that you can't bear and you were never meant to bear. But it's because you've been eating them. We're healed. We're healed. This is the passage that says, and by his stripes we're healed. Sometimes we only refer that to our body and our ailments. But what about your heart? What if your heart is sick? What if your heart is damaged? What if your heart has holes? This is why his body was broken. It was set there. In the same way, healed by the punishment he suffered and made whole, made whole by the blows that he received. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup right here, this is my blood. The blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the, given, for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, this cup, I poured out my blood to forgive your sins. It's a new covenant. Whenever you sit down at the table and drink this, remember me. And proclaim the Lord's death until I come. Or until he comes. This is a picture of when we sit down with him, we sit down, we played it, and then we take and eat. And what will happen is, every time I enter a conversation with the Lord, and I place myself down and say, find out what he has to say. I position myself to receive what he offers to another. You see, my love for somebody is only because of his love in me. And unless I receive his love for me, see, the person that can't forgive has just forgotten what they've been forgiven of. We stumble over offenses and all these kind of things. Because the fact of the matter is, and this is why it happens and when it happens, when we've stopped sitting with him. If you're offended this morning, if you are in a place of just, I'm talking to any relationship, there's path. Listen, it won't be a problem. You won't stumble every day if you'll sit with him. And that's what I saw this morning in my heart. Matter of fact, I, I wanted to do it. I didn't know if we'd have time. And so, uh, and I think I'm already past time. I don't even know what time it is. Way past. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm really great at that. Yeah. It's past time. It is. It's past time. It's past time you forgive. Way past way, way past. It's 11.43. We're going on two hours. Way past. So what do you do? Do you get up from the table? What do you do? Or do you eat? Are we going to get up from the table? You have one, I'll have the other. What do you want today? You can have whatever one you want. But I'm telling you, this one right here is really good. And that's why I gave out these uh, communion glasses this morning. Thank you, Ben. Is uh, just take a Take inventory. I know that hopefully this morning throughout the whole message you were taking inventory of, Lord, what are you saying to me? Wrong measuring stick? I don't know. Maybe just he was saying this to you this morning. I love you. I love you. See, that's what happens when we sit down and he plates his plate. 
in, in this bread, I didn't hear about all my sins. I heard about a payment that he took. I heard about his love for me. I have heard about his love for me. As I hear about his love for me, what happens is I'm filled again with his love. I'm filled again with that that I couldn't do on my own. I couldn't release myself of my debts. Why are we trying to release others of theirs on our own? We got to stop that. We need to sit down. We need to hear about the love of God for us again. And from that place, by faith, make a declaration. Father, I forgive them. I forgive them. For today, for yesterday, for tomorrow. And then we'll begin saying what he says about them. And you'll be amazed at how God unlocks the very thing that the enemy tries to destroy. And you'll walk in things that you never thought possible, but yet your heart saw pictures of. So, we're going to receive communion. You can keep playing if that would be great. We're gonna, and we'll close with this. I am no victim. When you sit down at the table and the Lord begins to speak and talk about his body that was broken, was beaten, was punished for our sins. And he said, break it and remember that I paid your price. Father, thank you. We receive your love. We receive your payment, your forgiveness, your release. Thank you for releasing us and paying a price that we couldn't pay. And Father, I thank you. You said you took a cup and you said this represents my blood. The forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins you know you weren't born when Jesus died on the cross so he couldn't pay for what you did on that cross he paid for what you would do this is why he calls it forgiveness this blood is a testimony that it goes before me it goes before me, knowing the end from the beginning. And he said, I see that. I saw how you messed up there. I saw how you messed up there. I saw how you messed up there. And the thing that you don't even know that's going to happen and where you're going to fall short tomorrow or next year, he said, I forgive you of that. I forgive you. And this cup, this blood, testifies of me going ahead of your greatest mistake and telling you that I love you and I forgive you. And just receive it in Jesus' name. Father, thank you this morning. We receive what you say about us. We just lift our hands and our hearts before you. And we just say thank you Thank you for forgiving us of every sin, of all of our shortcomings, of all the places we have yet to fall short. Thank you for being so good, for being full of mercy. Fill us today with your love let others see you because they see your love 
in us for one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you still need to go home and do some business at the table and you find yourself facing the same thing over and over again, take the stand again. Let him begin to speak. Let him remind you of your love, his love for you. And you'll see what you hadn't seen. Let him peel back some layers and you'll be healed. And the Bible says, pray for one another. So that's the next step. He sat down. Now, uh, as you go today, if, if anyone that was brought to your heart, pray for them that you may be healed. See, it's one thing to get the burr out. It's another thing for that wound to close to where it wouldn't get infected again. Pray for one another that you would be healed. So what do I pray? Pray for them what you would for your family. Pray for them what you would over your finances. Pray for them what you would over your children. Pray for them what you would over your business. Pray for them what you would for your destiny and fulfilling the plan of God for your life. Pray for them and you'll be healed and you won't stumble and you'll walk in that place. America, not America. Canaan, promised land. That which God has called you to and said, this is what I prepared for you. A place that's flowing with things you didn't build, things you didn't make, grapes bigger than pomegranates. Amen. God bless you guys. Sorry for keeping you a little longer today. But we'll see you uh, Tuesday night and uh, Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday night at prayer and Wednesday, uh, first Wednesday. Don't forget to order your Chick-fil-A.